My next reading is from the opening pages of the second lecture, which is entitled The Soul and the Substance of Existence. The theme of this lecture is the supreme subject and object of culture and the basis of all real religion and science. That is the substance of existence, the soul, universal and individual of humanity. Only when we know the nature of this can we know what we ourselves are and what we may become as our potentialities depend on the substance of which we are made. Since this subject, substance is not matter, a science which recognizes only matter and the material cannot help us reach an understanding of ourselves. In fact, such a science makes achieving this end impossible. Matter is not God. And in order to understand ourselves, it is necessary to understand God. God is the substance of existence. Therefore, to know God is to know this substance, and to know this is to know ourselves, and only by knowing this can we know ourselves. Such was the meaning of the famous mystical saying inscribed on the temple porch at Delphi, know thyself. A sentence which, though brief, incorporates all wisdom because, as the mystic or student of substance knows, such is the constitution of the universe that man cannot know himself without knowing God and cannot know God without knowing himself. And as only through the knowledge of the one can the knowledge of the other be attained, so the knowledge of the one implies and involves the knowledge of the other, since, as the mystic also knows, there is only one substance of which man and God alike are constituted. This substance, we, re we repeat, is not matter. And since matter is the direct opposite of spirit, so is materialism the direct opposite of the system we are setting out, namely mysticism, or as we propose to call it, spiritualism. And note that we shall be using this term not in its modern debased and limited sense, but in its ancient proper purity and fullness, in which it signifies the science not of spirits merely, but of spirit, that is, of God, and hence of all being. Thus, adopting and rehabilitating the term spiritualism, we shall define, firstly, the system we have recovered and are seeking to establish, and secondly, the system we condemn and are seeking to supplant. The system of spiritualism in the true sense of this term is not only a science, a philosophy, a morality, and a religion, but is the science, the philosophy, the morality, and the religion, of which all others are limitations merely. And the reasons for this are as follows. It deals with both substance and phenomenon, spirit and matter the eternal and the temporal, the universal and the individual. It is in itself a complete system of positive doctrine in respect of existence beyond which mind and heart cannot aspire. It provides a rule of knowledge, of understanding, of faith and of conduct. It is derived from God's own self, it is transmitted and declared by the highest intelligences in the human and spiritual worlds. It is also confirmed in every respect by the reason, the intuition, and the experience of the Earth's representative individuals, its sages, saints, seers, prophets, redeemers, and Christs. And no one has been able to refute it. 
And insofar as man accepts it, it promotes his perfection and satisfaction, both in this world and the next. The direct opposite of the system of spiritualism is that of materialism. This is not a limitation of spiritualism, but the negation of it. And is to it what darkness is to light, what non-entity is to existence, what the devil is to God, since it springs from the bottomless pit of man's lower nature. And because it has as its criterion not the conclusions of the mind or the experiences of the soul, but only the sensations of the body. Materialism is therefore not a science or a philosophy or a morality or a religion, but the opposite of each and all of these. And insofar as man accepts it, it promotes his decline and destruction both in this world and the next. According to mystical doctrine, man is placed between the two extremes presented of spiritualism and materialism, having liberty to choose and power to determine his destination in pursuance of the divine idea of which creation is the manifestation. And since spiritualism, as we use the term, implies the culture of the substantial and thus represents reality, and materialism implies the culture of the phenomenal only, and thus represents illusion, the choice between them is the choice between the perfection and the negation of being. But regardless of any quarrel the mystic may have with materialism over its exclusive recognition of matter and consequent idolatry of form and appearance, there is no such quarrel with matter itself. This is because even though matter is, by reason of its limitations, the cause of evil, it is not in itself evil. On the contrary, it comes forth from God and consists of that of which God's self consists, namely spirit. It is spirit, made cognizable to the outer world through subjection to conditions and limitations by the force of the divine will. Matter is thus a manifestation of that which in its, which in its original condition is unmanifest, namely spirit. And spirit does not become evil by becoming manifest. Evil is the result of the limitation of spirit by matter because spirit is God and God is good. Therefore, matter being the limitation of God is the limitation of good. Such limitation is essential to creation, since without a projection of divine substance, that is of God's self into conditions and limitations, or to put it another way, without a projection of being, which is absolute, into existence, which is relative, God would remain inoperative, solitary, unmanifest, and consequently unknown, unhonored, and unloved, with all God's power and goodness unexercised and merely potential. For anything other than God to exist, there must be something that is by limitation inferior to God. And for this to exist to the fullest degree corresponding to God's infinitude, it must involve the idea of the opposite and negation of God. In other words, for creation to be worthy of God, it must involve the idea of a no God. God's absolute fullness in respect of all the qualities and properties which constitute being must be contrasted with the utter deprivation of all such properties and qualities, which constitutes not being. The darkness of God's shadow must correspond in intensity with the brightness of God's light. And only through the fullness of the one can the other be properly understood and appreciated.
Only one who has ample knowledge of evil can thoroughly appreciate good. It is a profound truth that the greater the sinner, the greater the saint. That exquisite summary of the soul's history, the parable of the prodigal son, is based on the same text. Only they who have gone out from God, returning no God. So matter is an indispensable servant to creation, since without it and its limitations, there would be no creation. But mere creation does not represent the totality of the divine purpose, as deity would have shown itself by such a limited actuality to be just what the materialist imagines it, namely force. But on the contrary, God is love. And love does not merely create and then discard, but sustains, redeems, perfects, and perpetuates. And matter indispensably serves these very ends, and so contributes towards the second creation, which is the supplement and com complement of the first. This second creation is called redemption, and the creator finds through it his recognition and glorification, and man his perfection and perpetuation, since redemption is the full compensation both to God and the universe for all that is undergone and suffered by and through creation. And it is brought about by the return from matter of spirit to its original condition of purity, but individuated and enriched by the results of all that has been gained through the processes to which it has been subjected. Results which, but for, the ma but for matter, could not have been. Matter is therefore indispensable to the processes both of creation and perfection alike because it is through experience or suffering that we are made perfect. And we are only really alive and exist in so far as we have felt. Thus matter is the agent of this divine and indispensable ministry of experience. Such being the origin, nature and purpose of matter for the spiritualist who is also a mystic, he has no argument with it. On the contrary, recognizing it as intended to reveal God and to serve man's creation in the image of God, he regards the universe, the material universe, as a divine revelation and seeks by humble, reverent, and loving analysis of it to learn both it and God, and accordingly to make it serve his own perfection. Thus, guided by his intuition of spirit, he ascends from the exterior plane of matter and appearance, the plane which, as the outermost of man's system, forms the borderland between him and negation, to the interior plane of spirit and reality, where God abides in his fullness. And so, transcending nature's seeming, he attains the knowledge of God's and of his own being. The system for attaining these supreme ends, which is now openly disclosed for the first time in the world's history, has formed the hidden basis of all the world's divine revelations and religions. This is because from the beginning there has been one divine revelation, constantly re-revealed in whole or in part and representing the actual eternal nature of existence. And it has enabled those who received it to make the highest and best that could be desired of their own existence. This revelation known by various names, given at various places and periods, and finding expression under various symbols, has been a gospel of salvation for all who have accepted it, enabling them to escape the limitations of matter and return to the conditions of pure spirit. 
and thus to attain immunity, not merely from the consequences of sin, but from the liability to sin. Moving on now to the proper subject of this lecture, the soul, universal and individual, let us begin with the latter. The soul or permanent element in man is initially generated in the lowest forms of organic life, from which it works upwards through plants and animals to man. Its earliest manifestation is in the astral body, which is composed of a very fine ether. It is not something that is added to that body, but is generated in it by the alignment, albeit imperceptible, of its constituent particles with the divine. Once generated, it enters into and passes through many bodies and continues to do so until finally perfected or until finally dissipated and lost. The process of its generation is gradual, eventually culminating in the creation of a fire, a kind of crystallization of magnetic force. This is the soul, the sacred fire of the hearth, which must be kept burning continually. The astral body, which is the soul's immediate matrix, and the material body, which is projected by the astral body, both fall away and disappear over time. However, the soul, once generated and become an individual, is immortal, unless extinguished by its own perverse will, since the fire of the soul must be kept alive by the divine breath if it is, in, if it is to endure forever. It must converge, not diverge. If it diverges, it will be dissipated. The soul, therefore, which ascends, tends more and more to union with an absorption into the divine. The clearest understanding of the soul is to be had by defining it as the divine idea. Before anything can exist outwardly and materially, the idea of it must subsist, that is, be inherent, in the divine mind. The soul, therefore, may be understood to be divine and everlasting in its nature. However, it does not act directly on matter. It is projected by the divine mind, but the material body is projected by the astral or fiery body. As spirit on the celestial plane is the parent of the soul, so far on the astral plane, generates the material body. The soul being in its nature eternal passes from one form to another until at its most advanced stage, it aligns sufficiently to receive the spirit. It is in all organized things. Nothing of an organic nature exists without a soul. It is the individual and perishes finally, if not animated by the spirit. This becomes readily intelligible if we conceive of God as a vast spiritual body made up of many individual elements, all having only one will and therefore being one. But though becoming, but though becoming pure spirit or God, the individual retains his individuality and instead of all being finally merged in the one, the one becomes many. In this way, God becomes millions. God is multitudes and nations and kingdoms and tongues, and the sound of God is as the sound of many waters. The celestial substance is continually individualizing itself in order to build itself up into one perfect individual. In this way, the circle of life is accomplished and its ends meet up with each other. However, the degraded soul, by contrast, must be thought of as dividing more and more until eventually it is scattered into many and ceases to be an individual, becoming, as it were, fractured and broken up and dispersed into many pieces. 
The planet must not be regarded as separate from its offspring. It also is a person fourfold in nature and having four categories of offspring. Some of its offspring lie in the astral region only and are twofold, some in the soul region and are threefold, and some in the human region who are fourfold. The metallic and magnetic envelopes of the planet are its material body and astral body. The organic region is its soul, and the human region is its spirit or divine part. When it was metallic only, it did not have an individualized soul. When it was organic only, it did not have a divine spirit. But when man was made in the image of God, then spirit was breathed into its soul. In the metallic region, soul is diffused and unaligned with spirit. Thus, the metals are not individual, and since they are not individual, their transmutation does not involve transmigration. But the plants and animals are individual, and their essential element transmigrates and progresses. And man has also a divine spirit, and as long as he is man, that is truly human, he cannot go back into the body of an animal or any creature in the region below him, since that would be an indignity to the spirit. But if he loses his spirit and becomes an animal again, he may go back and disintegrating become utterly gross and horrible. This is the lot of persistently evil men, since God is not the God of creeping things but impurity personified by the Hebrews as Beelzebub is their God. <laughs>